Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Eric Lugberg. I'm a deputy CEO for, for Kambi. Um, I head up uh, the product organization of Kambi. I will be joined here by our COO, Jonas Jansson, and our uh, CTO, and Andreas, to walk you through, uh, well, the theme we're, we're planning for today is about this, so successfully navigating through conflicting demands. Um, and I guess the way I think about our mission at Kambi in the product is uh, really threefold. We're, we're here to meet the demands of the end users, and, uh, and our operators on one hand. On the other hand, we're also here to uh, really help uh, grow in Kambi's addressable market so that Max and his team has more opportunities to, to sell into. And the last part, building a bit on what, what Lars started with in this rapidly changing technological landscape to, to future-proof uh, our products so that we're also relevant in three and five years from now. And interesting uh, in, in our positions then is that this often is really, it's about conflicting demands to, to meet all these three needs. So we want to talk to you about how we address this at Kambi. Uh, and much of the focus will be specifically about our U.S. journey the, the last two years, because I think it's a quite good, good showcase to the, the capabilities that we have been, been all built up. Uh, let me start a bit basic. Uh, what is that we actually do? What, what does any sports book do? Uh, wh what do you do when you deliver this, this end user product called sports betting? You can look at it this way. Um, somewhere in the world, uh, 300,000 events year, per year is, is played in all various types of, of sports that may have some relevance to some, some end users to, to bet on. Uh, we buy data from all these uh, events in real time. Uh, and this data then streams into our system and our organization. Uh, so there we, we work with a mix of uh, specialist traders uh, and algorithms. So we use that data to, for any really type of occurrence of what can happen here to, to predict um, the outcome. So I think we heard before, we, today we do in a month 480 million uh, predictions like that, which is what we call odds then. Uh, that's, that's about 100 predictions per, per second. And we actually don't think that we, we get this right every time. It is impossible uh, to, at, at that scale, uh, with a quite small margin, get that probability right every time. And that, that leads us on to, to the third part here, which is really a core part of what we do, and that's the risk management. So in the, in the, in the life cycle of, of an odds as we publish it uh, on the site, a lot of new information comes. Uh, you have bets being placed, you have market movements, you may have injury news, you have, may have a really big bet, or you may have a, a really high uh, accumulated risk for one operator. And our risk management is about really optimizing at all times uh, um, the price given this new information that we get. At the, the heart, really, of risk management for us comes uh, what we call player profiling. So this is about for every end user really that, that does something with our product, we build a profile uh, of future profitability of that player. In, in around 98% of the cases here, um, we don't really act on the information from, from end users from a risk management perspective. But around 2% of the players, they actually come with new information to us that we use uh, in the trading to adapt the price. Finally, the last part is, of course, is channeling this out to, uh, to the players. So packaging uh, this big offering uh, in an exciting and intuitive user experience. You have the mobile client, the retail service terminal, the desktop. So I think over my years at, at Cumber here, I, I've, uh, I think I've learned that it's, it is challenging in itself to optimize and, and reach perfection in, in, in one function. That, that is a challenge, but it's totally doable. But really, the big challenge is making all these, these parts work really well together. And I think that's, 
That is one of the key reasons to, to our success at Camp. We have, more, more specifically what I'm thinking about, we have always looked at this entire chain. Ever since I started in 2005, we have looked at this chain being about one thing. And that's not about margin. That's not about accuracy and probability prediction. In the end, it is about user experience. It is about delivering entertainment. So our quant analysts, for instance, they're not tasked with the sort of um, theoretical challenge of, of only predicting probability. They're tasked with the, with the challenge of delivering a fantastic experience. If you think back of Christian's example of the football penalty. So we come from a US, UX experience. We do want to keep this open at all times. That is a really good experience. And that's what we come to our traders and, and mathematicians with. Can you solve it for us? So end to end here, we're really thinking about user experience. We're as much measuring our traders and algorithms in the type of entertainment value they deliver. That drives turnover as much as we're measuring in the actual margin uh, that they're predicting. So moving more on to a B2B uh, context then, that, that's about scaling this up. And for us, scalability is so one thing about scaling to new customers, it's about scaling to new end users, scaling to new continents like US, scaling to new channels. And at all time, what we really want to protect is what you saw on the previous slide here. We want to protect that core product. We want to make that better and better and better. And we want to move forward at pace. So that's the sort of contradiction here, handling a massive growth while, while still maintaining a scalable core for us. One big, I think, challenge of scalability uh, and limitation, you may say, really, from, as from a B2B perspective, we discovered around 2014. Um, and that comes, that is about differentiation. So back in 2010, the, the one word really to sum up our strategy was scalability. Around 2014, 2015, we, we had to evolve that and we had to add really differentiation to it. So we still want to stay true to this scalable model, but we needed to try to find ways where we actually can open up this, this platform and this technology so that each operator uh, can become unique and, and, and really drive towards their unique strategy. So today we think about our, this is not product strategy, this is really our entire business strategy. We think about it as uh, scalable differentiation. Uh, and differentiation for, for us, then, is it's a very deliberate approach. Uh, we're, we're not really opening up this core that you saw in the beginning. That, we believe, needs, needs to be done uh, as an end-to-end -end chain, really, that we have control over. But all other areas, most notably the, the front end, uh, there we invite our operators to come and innovate together with us. I think that the biggest change that has happened for us here the, the last uh, four years is when we really moved over from delivering a service, including a front-end client. We then started also delivering a service where you don't need to take our client. You, you can work directly on our APIs. You have our full product either end-to-end -end with, a, with a, a mobile and web client, or you can work directly on our APIs and uh, create this yourself. And it's only, I'd say, the last really one and a half, two years that, that our operators have started, build, they have started building up their own organizations. In some cases, uh, like with Unibet, I'd say we build half, they build half. Uh, in the case of DraftKings, they have more or less built everything uh, themselves. Um, so say something more about this scalable differentiation. I think that the easiest way to think about this, this as a strategy is the, the desired outcome uh, that we're looking for. So we say that we really achieve this uh, if we win significant operators with unique strategies at a premium price point without having to do bigger changes to our roadmap or organization. I think that that's really when we think we have managed to connect all three parts here, from the core product to scaling it up to adding the differentiation and all the way actually to aligning sales strategy and product strategy. Uh, that's what scalable differentiation uh, is about. 
Yeah, so I think it's important to know that this, this is not only about product. It's, it's as much, I think, about our sales department really working for us in product and vice versa, protecting our platform, selling what we are really good at. So, uh, moving over to, to US, I think US, if we become a bit less theoretical, US, I think, is really a good uh, use case to look, about, look at when we see, uh, I think, some of these capabilities uh, in, in action that, managed, um, that made us manage to launch uh, as number one in New Jersey and now leadership positions in, in US. So, I will hand over to uh, Andreas to talk about the first two challenges here about going and scaling into a new continent uh, with multiple new regulations, as well as scaling into a new, new channel, the, the retail channel in the casinos. And then uh, Jonas Jansson will, will talk to you about the new end user, the American end user, uh, serving, serving their needs. Thank you. My name is Andreas Sönby. I'm the CTO of Kambi. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the two first uh, challenges. And in order to do that, um, I'll need to spend some time in actually telling you the story of how we came to this capability. Uh, like the slide Oliver showed previously, uh, we started with pretty much a gray canvas. There was dot-com operations pretty much all across the world. Uh, at, uh, or in particular within EU boundaries, anyway. And uh, regulation, regulation started to happen. Italy was first. Back then, we were still part of Unibet. We uh, uh, didn't do anything in regards to Italy. We launched, but that was entirely outsourced. And uh, then France happened, and that was quite a significant impact for revenues for Unibet at that time, because the business conditions were quite detrimental versus what they had been during the dot-com uh, regime. So we realized that this is something that we really, really have to be able to deliver on. And we started to work on this. And that made us able to launch sort of a, a regulated solution for Denmark back in 2010. And we actually managed to uh, switch Italy from an outsourced solution into in-house as well. Back then, we were maybe five development teams. And this took a significant part of our development capabilities just to be able to deliver a new regulation technically, process-wise, uh, installing servers, setting up APIs to regulators, et cetera, et cetera. But we started to hone these skills. And we were able to launch in Spain pretty much until that market opened up. And it was also the first time where we really saw that going into a regulated market is an excellent business lever. Because our first customers we signed, uh, apart from Puff, was actually Spanish operators. I think, I think the first three operators were actually Spanish. And then fast forwarding a bit, I might say also that this is regulation from sort of the Canby standpoint. Northern Territory was regulated way before Canby was started, so was UK. But uh, during the years from 13 to 2017, we launched in quite a few uh, different continent, uh, continents and countries across the globe. And South Africa was probably where we uh, ended up in a situation that made us able to, to launch in the US because they have a very difficult regulation in the sense that you have to strike the bets in South Africa. A lot of our business model centers around not being forced to do local deployments. We want to maintain the core um, uh, and, and sort of not uh, having a, a separate install base just to trade in South Africa. That would never make any sense from a business point of view. Our entire business is high volume and low margin, so we have to really take care of, of the sort of the underlying fundamental capability of our company. But we had sort of honed our skills, and uh, we were actually able to create a component specifically for South Africa that made sure that the bets were stricken in, in, um, in South Africa. And that capability was like the perfect solution for uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and onwards. And this was 
we started development early 2017. Uh, in the end of 2017, maybe Q3, Q4, we realized that the Supreme Court hearing in December, this is probably going to happen. We always, we always thought that this would someday happen, but it became more or less uh, a very high probability that this would happen in the end of uh, uh, in December 20, 2017. So then we started, as always said, we started to talk to the regulators. We showed the solution we had in order to sort of uh, scale our business into new states, having the capability of actually <coughs> strike the bets in state. Uh, we have the additional complexity with the Wire Act in the US as well. So we were uh, honing our skills a little bit more. But this has really put us into pole position for <coughs> launching anywhere. And we did the US pretty much at the same time as we did Sweden and a few other regulations. So uh, the scalability of our business now in terms of uh, our ability to launch into new regulation is, is um, almost unlimited, actually. I mean, we, we, need, we need to deploy a small level of infrastructure in any new state that has this requirement. But it's, it's kind of a copy-paste operation. We can do this at speed. Obviously, there might be regulations that have more uh, stringent or, or quite different regulatory requirements, and then we have to do some development. But for the most part, and, and so far in the US, we've been quite successful with, with this uh, capability. So we're looking forward to the 40 or so states uh, being regulated in the next uh, few years. And the second challenge was uh, retail. We've been running retail for quite some time uh, before entering into the US market. Uh, and our core um, strategy has always been to build on our core capability in terms of sports betting and the online experience. So we're trying to bring whatever we do online into the retail space as well, with as little uh, adjustments as possible. In order to do that, we had to be firm about where our service starts and ends. So we're not doing any hardware, but we're really good at integrating into the hardware that you need in a retail operation. We do APIs for those who already have a massive install base of over-the-counter or uh, for like retail outlets like uh, ATG in Sweden, um, which is the trotting monopoly. Uh, so that made us able to actually launch six on property sportsbook in the time span of, of just a few months in the US. New Jersey first, and then uh, I think five or six installations in Pennsylvania over the course of two months. And they're all different, but they're yet the same can be underlying core product. And at the same time, we launched with ATG, 2,000 stores, 6,000 um, uh, sort of interactive terminals, uh, etc. I'm going to show you a short video of, of that uh, later. But my main message here is that we're, retail is not something that's kind of uh, just bolt on to an online service. We're doing re retail really well, actually. Uh, so this is a movie from uh, a launch uh, at uh, Parks Casino in uh, outside uh, Philadelphia. And one of the things that many uh, US operators, US casinos were quite skeptical about was our take on retail. We have a, a sort of a self-service view. We have the kiosks. That was quite a foreign uh, concept for Americans. They were very sort of till-based. You go to the over-the-counter, you place your bet, uh, you, get a, you get a paper slip, etc. We were emphasizing the ability to uh, uh, scale the sports book business for the American operators. You can imagine a place like this being absolutely packed when uh, uh, like any Philadelphia team is playing. It's going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people more than willing to uh, place a bet on, on uh, uh, anything during that game. It can be quite crowded. 
and without having the, uh, the self-service terminals, it's, it's massive queues. I don't know if you've hey, been... So today I'm going to take... So that was a demo. I'm not going to show that. And, and uh, then for um, uh, 8G, which is the, um, the, the horse racing um, monopoly in Sweden, we launched two minutes past midnight for all their uh, online and retail service. So they're using this concept of wallpapers, interactive wallpapers, where you can uh, browse their horse racing, which is their own internal. But at the same time, you can use the Canby Sports Bedding, which is uh, uh, powered by Canby, built on uh, our APIs. Um, So it, 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 um, it contains all the elements of our online service, but it's brought to the retail channel. So in Sweden, you're not allowed to put the cash into machines. You have to go to the teller. So you go to the teller, you pay your bet, uh, but you have a, a QR code on the bet, so it's automatically scanned and being placed. And we're also trying to bridge the gap between retail and online. And uh, uh, obviously, US being a market where retail is kind of going first in, in, in most states, it's important for us and for our operators to kind of familiarize the audience with the notion of online betting. And uh, again, it's, it's quite a lot of people at the sports book at, uh, at large events. So we, we have built this solution where you can actually um, find your selection. You can place or sort of you can uh, place your bet uh, or at least create the bet slip. And that creates a QR code that you can go to the over the counter and just show that it's being scanned and you pay. So there is no sort of selection process taking place at the till, but you're sort of uh, speeding up the process of actually placing the bet uh, quite a bit. You can also use this uh, capability, obviously, for uh, on-prem on mobile. Uh, mobile betting in the US is usually, that usually means that you're at the casino, within the casino compound. It's not online in the sense that we think of, of mobile betting. Uh, you can use a solution like this as well. You can have a hostesses or hostess um, to um, uh, walk around the casino floor. Someone can select their bet and just scan that, hand over the money, and your bet is placed. Um, and one of the things that we have done uh, in order to be able to do this is obviously to streamline the launch process for, I mean, our ability to launch six or seven casinos in, in, in a short time. One of the things that we've spent a lot of time on is actually improving the launch process as much as possible. It's quite a large operation, including logistics and configuration, et cetera, et cetera. We're at the point right now where we could, for an operator that has sort of already an install base and want to go into a new casino, just send them a USB stick, really. And for them to just plug it in, it will uh, automatically configure itself, connect to our services, and be up and running within a very short time frame. So the, the lat uh, latest uh, launch for parks in Pennsylvania, we were practically not involved with. And that's not to say we're sort of leaving our customers to their own luck in, in terms of installing this, but we, we want to make this process as seamless and as efficient as possible. So we're looking forward to more states uh, regulating and more casino properties, properties opening. And now I'll hand over to Jonas Jansson. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Jonas Jansson, and I'm CEO of uh, Cambi. Uh, I'm going to talk you through um, the, what we have done to deliver for, for the new end users in the US. 
but also, I mean, what we are continue doing and right now and a bit in the future. Of course, I will not dig into everything, but I will take snippets here and there so you get an understanding of what the challenge has been. Uh, and at the same time, I also hope we can get an understanding of how kind of strategically we are looking into when we develop the product. Uh, and I want to reiterate one thing that Andrea said around the self-service terminals. So I was visiting parks last week in, in, in the US and it was three o'clock Wednesday. So it wasn't super busy in the casino, but the self-service terminals were busy and the over-the-counters were totally empty. And <laughs> the CEO of, of Parks Resort he just come to me and smiled and he thinks it's excellent because of course that's increased the efficiency for them in the casino, the more people that go to the self-service terminals. So um, localizing uh, the product. So um, first of all, I mean, we have been doing this in, in the past. We've been localizing products for, for Colombia. We have been localizing for the UK and so on. But uh, the USA is, uh, is a bigger challenge, first of all, because it's uh, have, even though, I mean, the sports betting has been legal only in Nevada, it really have a different look and feel, a localized sports book. So from that aspect, it's a little bit more challenging. And then also the importance for us, because the market will grow and be so a big part of our revenues. Um, <clears throat> so, what we have done when it comes to, to, to the localization before we went live is a lot of things here. I mean, we have I mean, obviously changed the odds. We have changed how you present the different bet offers. You have uh, the home team after the home team and so on. Um, it changes to the clock, to the terminology and bet types. But I think one interesting part to look into is what we call thesis. So in the US, they have the concept of thesis where on the main line, you can add more points. So and that's built on, on a table. So it's not really built on the actual odds. So for us, either we could have the choice to act, just copy what was existing in the US market at the time, or try to utilize the handicaps we already had, because today we are already pricing all the handicaps. So add four points in basketball or six points in American football is nothing new for us. So because of us doing that, it became more of a front end challenge and we didn't need to go into the back end and change the actual calculations. Because of that, we were saving time when we built it. And also we could brand it TC Plus because on average, the end user will get a much better odds with our solution than they get with, with, with the table. <clears throat> so this is ways, I mean, around scalability that we need to think about when, when we build it to do things in a clever way. This will not be used in Europe, maybe, but we utilize the product we already have to do it in a better way in a new region. Um, <clears throat> During the time now, we, we are doing a lot of UX research, both ourselves and together with our partners. So the localization has at no means stopped here. We will continue to build and make our product more and more American for the American users. Um, I think we will go in now to the next slide and look more to what we are doing now around the offering and um, see what's happening there. So, um, of course, when we went into the US, um, we also had to increase our offer, especially in the American sports. So this came at the same time when we saw that we really have to update our trading platform. And the reason to do that is to get uh, a more holistic trading platform, which in between what we call the core sports book, in event combination bet builders and also player specials. I will not go through the player specials in, in this session, but you think about it as a third one. 
So strategically, we choose then, as I mean, so much is happening to the US, to focus mainly on the US sports together with soccer. So <clears throat> when we look at the core sports book, so this is really our, I mean, trading system. So it's now an integrated system pretty much alive. This is, of course, not our first version. It's our fourth version of trading systems. And we have, as of now, rolled out baseball and basketball in production. They are not, I mean, fully finished yet. We will continue to develop on them to add features all the time. But base, baseball and basketball is out in production. That's why they are green. Uh, American football will be out with the new version before NFL starts uh, in the autumn. <coughs> and then we will do soccer and ice hockey at the later stage. So from, uh, from a quality perspective, uh, Eric talked about that we, when we look at the product and the traders, we don't only look at the margins. An uh, important aspect of it is to evaluate uh, the quality of the product. So uh, after releasing basketball, we have seen up to 50% improvement in the KPIs we are following for, from a UX perspective. Um, so that's one reason of it. The other reason is for us to be able to, to increase the number of events that one trader can handle at the same time. So this will also continue to increase the efficiency in the operation we are doing. So, um, as, so for, for next season in US, um, it depends a little bit on what feeds uh, we will have, but we are prepared for college basketball to offer up to 5,000 college basketball events next year. This year, this season, I think available feeds were around 3,000, 3, 3,500. So, but it's also an expectation that the feed, feed providers will cover more events. Uh, in college football, we will be able to cover up around 800 events next season. On the professional sports, NFL, MLB and so on, we, we of course cover all events uh, in live betting. Um, but when we, when we develop these uh, new trading tools, it's, it's not only about the tools. Uh, I mean, a huge aspect of it is, is the modeling. And uh, same here, uh, I mean, it's not the first version or first iteration of the models that we are currently using for, for the American sports. So last season, we uh, went live with a new uh, American football model. And the ambition is to have a further upgraded American football model before this season starts. Baseball, we are just now rolling out a new version iteration of the baseball model. All of this, I mean, we are doing, of course, to, I mean, improve the user experience, but also to be able to offer more uh, markets. The last few years, we also started to look more into machine learning uh, models in order to add predictive capacities into the, into the models. Um, so, for pretty much, we have uh, been live with uh, certain leagues for, for up to two years now, where it's really the models who are pricing, I mean, the markets, and, and the trader is just overviewing what goes out, out on the site. Um, we also, I mean, to oversee this, have a, have a big uh, team of traders. And I, I want to cover a little bit, uh, I mean, about the American office. So we're, in the process of opening an office in Philadelphia. And the long-term aim, I mean, what we have is that we should not increase the trading team. I mean, that should stay as it is and long-term, I mean, be smaller. Uh, now, when we're opening in the US, what we look for a lot is Oliver's team, Sportsbook Control, and the risk team to have people in the US to get them closer to, to our operators. Uh, because that will support in the service level we can give to them. We are also looking for specialist U.S. traders, and that's to complement the U.S. trading team that we have in London and other places. I think it can be interesting as well to talk a bit 
I mean, when we look at the US trader, what, what are we looking, looking at tiring? Because that might not be exactly the same as another bookmaker or trader look for. So the profile of the first, so we assigned the, now I think three or four traders or odds compilers who will start when we open the office. And the profile of the first trader we hired was um, he's just uh, uh, graduated from, from an Ivy League university. He has been playing baseball on the university team and he has a high analytical capability. And it's, from my opinion, it's fantastic to be able to hire that kind of, of people in, into our organization. And that's something we have seen in other locations, especially in London in the past as well, that it is to be in this industry, you can attract super skilled people from university who are interested to work with sports and that's the biggest passion. So it's, it's a good place to be in. So um, the next part of the trading platform is in event bet builder is the possibility to combine uh, different outcomes within an event. We have released that for, for soccer now and we have the, these three American sports in train. They will be in the first step a little bit more simplified version. So it will not include player specials and so on, but it will be the possibility to combine the main bet offers. I will not go so much into detail into the, into the bet builder and exactly how it's built. But I think in the next picture, I will point out a couple of interesting pieces. And here I will reflect on the, on the UX research. So now when we talk, talk with end users in the US, they, they can't understand that this hasn't been possible because that's the behavior that has been in the US and it's partly driven because the offering has been much smaller than it has been in Europe. So then it's fairly easy to do these kind of combinations. While in Europe, if you look, the offering has increased this much and then now we are trying to do this afterwards. And that is not always so easy. So I will go into, um, we can have a look at our bet builder and then afterwards look at the challenges. Yeah, so this is, um, was supposed to be an animation, but I think it works very good in this way because that's what I need. Um, so you can populate here with three different bet offers, so Tottenham to win, total goal scored, and both team to score, um, and then place that combination bet. But uh, one thing, that the challenge is here is from a technology and a model perspective, the performance needed to ask for this combination. Because a normal bet offer, you can save down the probabilities in tables and it's readily available when you want to place the bet. Here, it's so many different combinations and each of them is unique. So you run into a kind of a performance problem when you're going to ask for this each and every time. The second one is um, here, it had been a possibility for us to, to outsource this part of the product mm -hmm. and use that one in conjunction with our core. However, as we see this is now, it is a different tab up here that is just kind of front end because that's how they are used to pro, uh, present today. This is not necessarily how it's going to be in the future. In the future, Eric talked about the core. This will be the core because if you looked at the American user that we talked about, they are used to combine everything. So why would not that not apply to the European user even though the offering is much bigger? And then. For our core, we need to be able to handle this and build that internally. And hence, that's a product development decision that we can't outsource. It's something we need to be able to build internally. Um, so we have talked now uh, quite a bit about, uh, I mean, what we have been doing and what we are doing. 
Uh, I would also like to just finish off with a video of, I mean, the product we have today is, is pretty good. So it's a video of uh, NBA playoffs last year and it's same as NBA playoffs this year. And it is uh, the instant, instant betting uh, product for basketball. If you follow the video, you will be able to see how you can bet on in each uh, kind of possession on next uh, field goal. And you will also have um, play specials on the most uh, kind of famous players in each team. And a whistle off the ball. First so foul there you have the next field goal. Uh, Shepard picks up his first. James getting a rest. What a start. 15 points on 7 of 8 from the field. Hard screen set on Shepard. Curry has love on him. Pulls back. Fires a 3. Knocks it down. Steph Curry with his first field goal. And to me, that's got, you've been trapping him. Then next possession you can add on next field goal and bet straight again on it. This is something, I mean, Christian showed in the beginning the penalties. If you go back in time, I mean, tennis, we were the first really to produce the games and the points in play. And for a certain segment of, of, of our play end users, this is something they really like. But it's also something that pushes us all the time to offer a really, really good product. Um, I have a quite interesting anecdote. So it was Oliver, when he talked earlier, he, he mentioned that he was uh, uh, traveling around in the US having some presentations at different regulatory events. Uh, I'm not sure which one this was, but I think it was uh, early autumn last summer. Then the day before Oliver and our legal representative was going to have their presentation, it was a CEO panel uh, in, in the US. And on that one, it was one CEO from, from a company who mentioned that we can't offer live betting on basketball because it's too fast. And uh, the day after, Oliver and uh, Tommaso showed this slide. So, of course, we can offer live betting on basketball. It's, I mean, just about the setup you have. And we, we promise you that the players in the US will love this product as much as they do in Europe. And what we have seen so far is that the proportion of turnover on this market is actually slightly higher in the US than it is in Europe. So it's, um, it, it works there as well. So, thanks a lot. So, I will talk through about, uh, I think, our top three, really, capabilities that, that we're now uh, focusing on building up. Uh, think a bit more, probably three to five years uh, that we want to prepare for. N number one for us, it, it really ties in a lot to what, what Jonas is, is, is talking about. Um, we, we phrase it as making algorithms and data first-class citizens uh, within Cambi. I think us, like many other companies, we, we for some time, run around like headless chickens, wondering how AI will, will, will change our business and our industry. Uh, I think we've stopped with that, and we're not focusing so much about AI. We, we're really focusing down to, to the actual data and what that will, will mean. So <clears throat> not, it becomes, I think, for, for us and in our industry, it becomes quite obvious how, how this will change. I mean, it, it comes down to, back to our core, the, the probability prediction and the, the user experience and, and the risk management. As the data becomes richer and richer, you, will, you and your competitors will be able to make better and better predictions. And as the data becomes richer and richer, you and your competitor will be able to offer new interesting experiences. Like I think what the video we saw before here is probably cutting edge of what's possible today with the, with the data that is, that is available uh, from an offering perspective and to be able to predict those probabilities. But, but this is changing rapidly. We have, the, we have some companies now they, uh, with, with um, image recognition, they are 
able to, uh, to set the fatigue level in, in NBA players. I mean, obviously that is, if you do that right, that, that can drastically change the odds compared to a human being just uh, watching the match when, you get, when it gets that rich. Uh, you have several of the leagues now starting to discuss putting a chip in the, in the puck or, or in the ball. Uh, there's probably some political hurdles in that, but that definitely will happen as well. Uh, we have looked at an API from, um, from one league uh, where they actually they gave us the XYZ uh, coordinates of, uh, of the ball or, or the puck, wherever that may be, uh, and they update that, I think, 200 times per second. Uh, and you get all the players and the rotation of them. I think anyone is quite far away from, from having the, the capabilities to utilize this in sports betting, or I think for, for most industries. But for us, it's obvious that this change is, is happening. So technically, process-wise, people, organization, we're really moving towards where the algorithms really becomes a, I think, a first priority for, for Cambi. And it's really paving the way for algorithms to, to be developed, to be tested, to be enhanced, uh, and really to be using the data that is available. Second one, um, so large-scale agile de development. Uh, we, talk, we talked before about um, I think more or less doubling uh, the number of development teams over the, the past uh, 18 months. Uh, and we're increasing that again this year with, with another 35%. And it's, I guess, when you're 10 uh, development teams, what you need to be really good at is, is <laughs> asking them to do, build the right things. When we're getting closer towards 40 and 50 teams, it becomes possibly even more or as important to actually how you work with these teams. How you have 50 teams on one product that Camry really has. We, we, don't, we, we don't have really distinct separated products. We build one sports book. So they're all dependent on each other. So we work really hard now on trying to figure out for the future, coming 50 development teams, how will this actually work again from a people, process, and technology perspective. Last capability I, I wanted to mention um, is around an ecosystem um, to help innovation across the industry. So we have identified that the, the enabling technology we have built out, out for, for the differentiation we talked about before, um, the APIs to build your own user experience, the, the bonus systems, the the flexibility our operators have to, to adjust uh, the prices, still based on our core of trading and risk management. We think that there's, there's today our operators are using this. We think that this can far, further evolve um, to become a really powerful ecosystem. Um, we're actually probably back to where Christian started. We didn't go into uh, B2B sports betting to to be an alternative to cut costs or, or to help failing sports. But we went into this to really in the end deliver a model where better user experiences can happen because of the outsourced model, because of more efficiency in the outsourced model. Delivering more, more end user value, basically. We think of a bit the development we have seen in the sports book up until now, it's, it's quite linear. It is um, quite slow, it is smaller adaptations and, and improvements like the live betting come around 2005. Many regulations, often to the end user value, uh, five years later you're adding mobile, you're adding cash out and now probably the most recent one in terms of innovation to the industry is the bet builder. It, it's not a rapid change uh, and it's not a huge change, it's still about uh, uh, placing your bet on, on your team um, and, and see if you win. Although it's changing with live and mobile, the channel, of course. I think what we saw already in 2010 was that a big reason that this is not happening so fast is that everyone is doing the same thing uh, for themselves, more or less. So you have around uh, 20 or 30 or 40 sports books. They're all building this from the bottom up. They all have to go through the heavy lifting of becoming compliant in Italy, and then that next regulation, then adding this to the mobile channel, etc. So what Cumber was all about was really let us do that heavy lifting, and we open up uh, in the UX, 
uh, and other areas, open up with the data so that you really can bring something new uh, to, to your end users in the end. And this is around that, that ec ecosystem and this capability that we're, again, it's, it's about the process, it's about the collaboration, about the co-creation with operators. It's about inviting more third parties to really utilize the, the, the powerful platform that we have built uh, to come innovate together with us, to springboard the innovation. Yeah, that, that's it for us in product. Thank you very much.